All right, it is uh, 10 o'clock on the hour. Um, although you have a box there for John, he is uh, unfortunately has a conflict this morning and won't be with us. But uh, hopefully with Jim's uh, help and as long as my voice lasts, I'll try and uh, moderate this this morning. Uh, we are gonna start with Don, but if others have um, items for show and tell, if you would uh, raise your hand, I'll uh, be able to recognize you from there. Otherwise, welcome this morning and uh, take it away, Don. Right, last week I was on about the owl. There was two things I mentioned or didn't mention. One, I apologize to Mike, he asked me a question. Had I painted the candle on top of the candle? And I said, no, well, when I thought about it after I said that, I realized I had, and I used Mylan's spirit, water spirit dye for that. And the second point is, the one piece of safety I didn't mention was, when you come to use the router, please make sure you switch your lathe off at the mains. Because I've had somebody who didn't and thought they were going to switch the router off and they switched the lathe on. And it throws you all out. So please make certain that if you do the router on the owl's eyes, you switch the lathe off at the main so that if you did inadvertently hit the button, you don't set the lathe going. That's it. Thank you. Unless you've got a question on the Mylands. Sorry about that, Mike. You did ask the question. And I completely uh, messed it up, didn't I? All right. Thank you, Don. That thank was, you. Uh, Thanks for sharing. Looks like Mike Peace jumped in next here. Well, you know, along with that line, I made a couple of... Uh, of Bert's uh, <laughs> candles, and they they are very addicting. Uh, I find it does take a few before you get the process down and and the little details on how to glue it and the, the right shape of the flame. Uh, here was a different model I found on the internet, and I found if you just turn a different color uh, piece of wood and glue it in the flame, that that's an alternative. But it does take a little more time, but it's got a little different base. You don't have time-wise, they were about the same. You don't have the fussiness of the ring, but you can't turn as easily twice as two of these at one time. And you know, you can put the flame on either model. That's all I've got. Well, that's great. It's a nice option, I think. Uh, Toby, I think you are next. Well, I have a little slideshow to present, if you're okay with that. Sure, bring it on. All right. Let me share screen. Big right. hunk of wood there. That's a, that's a piece of uh, elm. Okay. okay let, this, is, this is part of my presentation that I did at our local club about people asking, how do you decide what to make out of a piece of wood or what's the best way to cut it up? So this is the piece that I started out with in my slideshow and I normally what I do is I look at a whole bunch of different angles and kind of decide well if I take a piece off here what's going to be left and what is this piece going to look like all those decisions you have to make here I'm just showing what the size of it is so it's about 13 by 12 by 14. So it's got a lot of different areas where Burl is showing are you all getting the picture okay? I'm not sure about my bandwidth here. No, it's all yep. good. Okay. So here I decided to make a, my circle here. I'm gonna, I was going to make a little a vase out of it. So this is how I started out. I just put my calipers on, or my whatever this thing's called. <laughs> Dividers. <help> Compass. <laughs> Dividers. Do, well, okay. So I drew a circle and then I, I just found the center and drew it on the bottom of that piece. It's the same same area except it's on down here on the bottom. So I drew that out and then I cut the square out on the bandsaw. So here, oh, actually I did a chainsaw, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I got that piece cut out. And there it is on the laying on my lathe. Here I got it started. Rounding it over.
Mara flipped it around. Yes. Now, at this point, I decided there's a lot of wood down on the side there. I should probably try and core that out if I can. Well, I guess it's after this point. To this point, maybe. <laughs> So the strategy is to put the top, um, the I would say the natural edge or the um, the burl eyes on top here, and the um, kind of the the straws as we talk about it uh, that feed into them over on the sides. Is that kind of your strategy here? Yeah, I like to leave the natural edge and the spikes on the uh, you know the feature part of the piece of wood, in my opinion, anyway, and you know. That's sort of my style, leaving the natural edge like that. Here I am coring it out. So, I, what would you doing? So uh, this is the uh, coring system, uh, McNaughton. I also have a one way that I use on my other way over here, but this one fits on on my jet, sixteen forty two. So I kind of made a deep. Uh, of this piece, and there it just came out. So I set the little one aside, and then I finished out the, the bigger piece. And there's the finished piece. Toby, how much do you sand those? Uh, how much sanding is in that? Toby's gone. Yeah, I think we lost him. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me show you a quick something, which I think is the same kind of thing Toby is talking about. And uh, it's something I work on as well, is to try and orient the view in a, in a burl. This is a red Mallee burl. Um, where I put all the eyes on top, tried to get that natural edge to show there, and then hollowed out uh, to give you the rest of the detail on the sides. So uh, I, I think orientation of the burl is a really important subject if you're going to try and do those things and try and get the, the features that you want by how you orient it. Um, Cindy Drosta is really big on that, and she gives a nice couple of IRDs to describe that. Um, but it's something I still work on uh, because you're never quite sure what a burl is going to be until you start taking it apart. But you can pretty much understand from the piece of it of where their spikes are on top or the bottom and orient the piece and cut it so that you get the maximization from that. So um, I, I think that was part of what <laughs> he was trying to say. And uh, it's something I work on as well. Anyone else have comments on that, that topic? I, I'm back now. Oh, okay. my, inter my internet here, the service in the morning, it drops out for like 45 seconds every now and then. I don't know why. All right. Well, so anyway. Can you open your share again then? Yeah, I'll start it again. Okay. I don't know how far you got here on this. Well, we saw that. So, so, okay. So there's a side view of the, this is the initial piece that I took out of that original lump that we had laying on the floor there. Am I going backwards? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I think that's where you left this. Okay. Here's this, yeah, here's the smaller piece that I put back on the lathe and I put a tenon on it, shaping the outside and the inside. There's the cord piece that was out of the bigger, bigger one. There they are together. The little one came out of the bigger one. So now I'm back to this original piece of wood that I had, and I uh, have this part left over. So now what else can I get out of this? So I just got rid of these check marks on the side here. And I was left with this piece over on the on the right. Use my compass again to draw a circle. 
put it on the lathe and made this shape out of it. Again, I have the natural edge on top because that's to me, that's the feature of the piece of wood. Proceeding down through the turning here. This one I didn't pour because it was too small, so I just hollowed it out and I made a little rim on the inside here for a lid. There's the inside of it. And I flipped it around, did the bottom of it, put a little bead on the on the base. There's the finished piece with the lid. That's pretty unique. So then I have back to the original piece again. And I saw this area down here, so I drew a, my shape on the side here, cut it out, put it on the lathe. Turn that, put a little ring down here. Now, at some point here, yeah. When I was hollowing this piece out, I failed to spin the lathe as I had my uh, tool rest up against when I was going to hollow it. And I chipped out some of these pins out here on the, on the rim. So I just decided to cut it all off. So that's why it doesn't have the natural edge on the top any longer. The pins came around and hit the tool tool rest here because I didn't check it. I just turned the lathe on and boom, that was the end of the, the rim. But I decided to finish the piece off anyhow. Turn it around. Here I have a, a uh, kind of a dowel going into the bottom so that it's compression chuck. I do almost all my uh, taking the tenons off. I use with a compression chuck. There's the finished piece, which I dyed just to see how it would look. And that's another style of mine. Gives it a different look. So I still have this piece left over, so I'm looking at it again. Well, if I, it's a nice flat area here, so I drew a circle on there. Sliced that off with the chainsaw and then the bandsaw cut the circle out, put that on the lathe. So would you, Toby, what, yeah. what made you grab that circle? Can you go back to the, the previous slide? Well, there wasn't any other area here I could see at the time there was, you know, looked like I could get another vase or a bowl out of it. So I decided to just slice this area off and use this part. I just, I don't know why. <laughs> just my decision. So everybody gave, makes their everybody makes their own decisions, and this is mine. So you thought it gave you the maximum piece, or because uh, I'm just looking at where the burl orientation is and trying to to rationalize it. I guess at this time, I I wasn't thinking or considering the burl figure in there. I just decided to make a, a slice off of it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So anyway, I go through this, you know, turning this piece. And there's the final piece. So it, it has figure in there. It does have some burl. It just shows it at a different angle. There's the side view. Ah. Oh. So the piece that was left then, uh, ah, this piece, the uh, bulb part here is actually willow. This, the lid part is more of the elm from this piece, but I actually took a slice, another slice from a cross section behind this, this piece to make the lid for this because it it had enough solid area. There were a lot of fissures behind behind in this section here. That was probably another reason that I decided to just take a slice off of here. So there's the final piece of the willow elm walnut. And this is seaside mahu is, is some kind of a 
tropical wood from Key West, Florida, just a little medallion underneath the lid. What, Toby, what do you use? I think I showed this one before. Go ahead, Jim. What, what do you use for your beading? You're using like a D-Way beading tool or what? Or are you cutting them with a skew, your beads? Yeah, I use the, I use the, uh, the I think it's the D-Way. Okay. What, what's the other one that, that makes a beading tool? Well, well, that style, Ashley Isles makes one that looks like the D-Way and the rest of them tend to have a little different style. I think Sorby makes them. Okay, it's a D, it's the D-Way then. I have two sizes. I think I have a quarter inch and a, and a three sixteenths or something like that. But yeah, I use I use that quite a bit now. I think even on this piece down here, this was another piece that I had a chunk of wood and I decided to make. I think I showed this before. This is how I the finished piece was oriented in the uh, chunk of wood that I had. This is the piece that won the award to, at the uh, local art show. Very nice. And also I made another piece on this side, the, kind of a twin of this one over here on this side, only I dyed it green. And it's it's sold already at the, one of my stores. So you don't make any of your decisions where you're out chainsaw and you would kind of wait until you bring it into the shop put it on the bandsaw i know i make a lot of decisions in fact a guy just brought me a, uh, a huge burl it's a white oak burl probably almost two feet in diameter and I, same thing with with the initial piece that i had here i set that thing up on its end and i look at it and i walk around it 360 and trying to decide what to do with it. Sometimes I'll turn it on the side, I'll turn it upside down. What happens if I cut it here? Yeah, there's a lot of decisions that go into making the uh, the initial cut, especially with a chainsaw, because once you cut it with a chainsaw, then you know it's, it's permanent. You, you got to deal with what's left. So there's a lot of thinking going on. You're, you're dealing mostly with really large burls, right? Well, not necessarily, no. Sometimes oh, okay. I'll have a little cherry burl. It might only be like four inches in diameter. And I'll make one of these little pieces out of it. Still, you still have to decide which the best orientation because every burl has different features. It might have a, a a hole going down through it or some ants coming out of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I asked because a lot of the ones I get from the local arborist are like a single branch that has a burl kind of on the kind of on the one side. Well, that presents challenges with positioning it on the lathe. And uh, I sometimes end up with a plain branch wood on the one third of the thing and the other half has burl on it, so. Yeah, yeah that happens. I've, had, I've done that also. There's different ways of dealing with it. Sometimes if you can do it uh, end grain style, sometimes that works out for you too, depending on what the burl is. Yep. This is another- be The part without the burl is what goes in the chuck. But uh, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> this is just another piece I had. This is uh, maple burl, and I, I I forget what I cut it from. But this at this stage in my turning, I decided it was too deep for my liking to hollow out down through there. So I decided to uh, just go with the parting tool and cut down through and make two separate bowls out of it. So it's just another decision along the way of what, what to do. There's the two pieces. And that's, you know, you part down through with the parting tool and then finish off with a saw. That's how I do it. So this is the top half of it. That's as far as I got with my pictures. <laughs> okay, that's the end of my slideshow. But we can talk about it anymore if you want. I was thinking before you cut it, that was a really nice hollow form blank. Um, but it's <laughs> each we each do what we we see in it, and it can be very different. That's yep. Perfect. Yep. Right. Everybody makes their own decisions, and I, I at this point I decided to make two separate bowls out of it. So that was my decision. Absolutely. It, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I can get twice the price that way. 
<laughs> Sometimes. That's another thought. <laughs> could, could you kill the share there, Toby? Yep. All yeah. right. Anyone have questions or issues for, for Toby or suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think one of the challenges is using the little leftover uh, scraps. You know, for, th for this one I showed, for example, the flame is made out of a tiny little scrap of cherry burrow, which I think adds a considerable character to the flame. And yeah. and otherwise, it would have been th too small for anything except uh, firewood. Yeah, I, I have a boxes and boxes full of cutoffs like that. Every once in a while, I'll, t I'll take them into the uh, to the club and uh, give some away. And, and some of them are just like pen blanks and I don't make pens, so, it's, but still somebody can use them, so, yep. That's I, I, I have a question about commonality of shapes. I know we talk about bowl turning, but what about vases? I find myself leaning more and more to it. And when I get around to it, if I get a chance to share, I'll show you a piece that's related to vase turning. But I, it, what's what do people want to buy the vase or is that just a cop out uh, way to sh deal with a long skinny piece? I, I sell vases in my in my shops. Do you? Yeah, it, okay. yeah everybody, everybody has the way I look at it. You make something. There's somebody out there who's going to like it eventually. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and and uh, almost everything I've made is has sold, so I think it it run, rings true. <laughs> yeah, that well, sounds great. All right, let's let's try and move on a little bit. Hi, Toby. Oh, okay. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, Toby. This is Carl. I just wanted to tell you, I think you've been reading my diary. I've got a big chunk of burl, and I didn't know exactly how to start, but you gave me a good inclination. And I do like the natural edge, and I think you've answered my questions. Thank you, sir. Oh, glad I could help. Thanks All for right. letting me know. Let's move on to John. Hey, John, what have you got? Okay, I'm unmuted now. <clears throat> or unmuted. Good. All right, now, this is a little off topic. It's about wood. And since you were looking for some hands, um, this past week I, I moved my, or relocated my, uh, canoe rack. It's been in place for over 25 years. We've used four by four posts that are pressure treated. And this piece of wood, this is the bottom that's been in the ground for over 25 years. And the reason it's not rotted is because I put it in sand and not in concrete. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I just wanted to share, I was amazed at, at the condition uh, of the wood. It, it actually was in better shape, the, the stuff that was underground, that was above ground. Uh, I've been an electrical contractor for many years. And a long time ago, um, I was putting in a fancy post and they said, put it in sand. And I said, scratch my head and said, okay. And I went back five years later and it was rock hard. Uh, this piece of wood has been supporting like six or seven canoes and kayaks for a long time. So anyway, that's it. I just wanted to share the idea. Don't put stuff in the concrete, um, put it in sand. I use sand and rocks, little three quarter rocks. It's the only way to go. Uh, that's it. How do you make it firm enough to hold the post so that it's not moving? Sand would let you move, wouldn't it? Nope. No. Uh, as you're putting it in, uh, you just tamp it down, or you could just add, you know, put water in there, and it's it doesn't move. All right. It's, it's, I, I know it's surprising. It's kind of counterintuitive and, and everything. And, yeah, um, the building codes would allow that here for a lot of the things, but... Uh... Uh, it's interesting that that would work. Well, this is for posts. Um, uh, building code wise, I, there's there's nothing um, that I, you know, for a lamp post or for um, posts in the ground, you know, like fence posts, stuff like that. Uh, I was thinking about a deck. Maybe it's because of John sitting there working on the deck, but uh, there I think you pretty much have to put them into concrete. Well, it, it deck is different. Then you're you're 
your um, you need to go below frost line and, and a lot of other things. And and typical, you don't put a post in the concrete. Um, you would uh, uh, you could use a piling, and uh, and then you use um, uh, they have metal brackets that actually keep the post off the ground, and you kind of bolt that in where you use uh, rods, but um, con uh, concrete and wood don't really go well together. Makes sense from the- uh... Yeah, they rot. <laughs> All right, Jim, uh, let's uh, see what you got. Okay. This is, <laughs> this is some fun stuff. Um, I had made this tall beaded vase, I guess you would call it. It's bored all the way down through, uh, sitting on a squarish spindle at the bottom or platform. And I thought, what am I going to do with this blasted thing? And then I remembered the kids' Fisher Price rings. I said, good, I'm just going to put them. I couldn't find the ones we had here, so I ordered them from Amazon, our good old store. Sure enough, they had the exact same set for like six, five, six bucks. It came. I proceeded to try to put them on. Guess what? It, <laughs> you see the middle. It didn't have any, uh, my shapes weren't right. So I said, okay, what am I going to do now? So I turned one. This is a Chinese tune. Uh, this, this uh, the beaded one is London plain so this is an international toy set here and then fisher price i made it so that they would fit down over and then i put a little beaded failed beaded top on it failed because it chipped a lot so i ground out the worst ones and sanded it down uh, my wife just shakes her head some guys think i have another issue because of the shape and size and i go it was just fun, you know, so any questions? <laughs> <laughs> no. You, oh, you didn't try and turn the donuts? <laughs> no, I have, I have limits on my time in the shop. I prefer to do other things and prove that I can turn donuts. Plus then I would have had to dye them, you know? <laughs> no, I said, this is just great. So I had fun. Um, Jim, I want to give you credit for getting them in the right order. I, I didn't sure that was going to happen. Well, the sh the shape of the holes kind of determined that, and the shape of the size too. The funny thing was the night, the day after our our na our um, daughter in law lives just down the street, and we have dinner with them a lot. So our granddaughter walks in and sees them on the table. She's like about to turn nine. She promptly dumps them on the floor and is down on the floor with her god. That's what she calls grandma. And they're rolling them around. And I said, well, see, the kids, even at that age, still have fun with them. She said, we've had fun with those rolling things since she was a baby. So anyways, yeah. So that was my fun. So I will, uh, depends what time is, I can pull some pictures over of the... Um, uh flame the crotch walnut if we have time i didn't pull them into my app yet into my photo app yet so i didn't know how much time but we have today and you can do that perhaps while we listen to barry who's uh got his hand up so let's oh yeah but when you're listening to barry he's an engineer you gotta pay attention to every little detail bruce <laughs> that's okay I just want right? to comment i just want to comment on your uh, stacking uh, pyramids there. Uh, it's a pre-calculus exercise for children because you uh, there's a method of taking uh, volume by slicing. So good job on the pre-calculus. Oh, <laughs> and I and I hated and I did I take calculus? I don't remember if I took calculus or not. Don't show you remembered about you. that puzzle is that you want to use two different colors and then the way you solve it is never put the same color on each one when you're going for the right. uh, free post game. But anyway, I, uh, did, I didn't tell you guys what I did. And I, and I thought, well, I can't put a flower in the top of that thing for the kids. And I go, pinwheels. 
So I went to my dear old Amazon and got some pinwheels and they happened to have the exact same colors on the pinwheel that the things were. I don't have a picture of that, but that was great fun. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Jim. All right, Barry, what do you got now that we've uh, primed you uh, for engineering? Now, last week I talked to you all about ideas for quick turning things for a uh, music fest where we were going to be demonstrating. And, and that went very well. Up until the point where the capacitor burned out on the wind way on the uh, jet mini lathe, mm -hmm. and so I have a a question for: Has anybody out there ever replaced a capacitor on a on an, on any lathe, or maybe even I'll say any lower horsepower motor? My question has to do with. Uh, the capacitor that was in it is a 25 microfarad, uh, 250 volt. And I can find uh, ones that are not 250 volts. And from what I have read, that's okay. All that indicates is the voltage you can tolerate. Uh, the key is the 25 microfarad. Uh, I didn't want to go too much higher for fear of uh, over-energizing the motor on startup. And uh, physical size, the ones that I found will not fit in the, uh, in the housing. And even the Jet Tools website, I can't find the part. Anybody ever replaced the capacitor? Yes, I have, and uh, it did not fit, so I used um, zip ties. I'd have to agree that uh, sometimes they don't fit, and I don't think it would be 25 microfarad MFD. It may be more of a, a higher capacity, but the 250 volts is just like you said, that's the top order. I think we lost Carl there. They mask, but you're, you're in good shape, and a tie wrap will keep. Is that your problem, Barry, that it won't fit or you can't find one at all? I would try a phone call to Jet, though. Um, they're usually pretty good with customer service. Question that you found one that won't fit or are you not sure which one to get it off? Well, I got it off. That wasn't a problem. The, the issue is the 25 microfarad that I can find on Amazon or a couple other electronic places are all physically too big to fit in the metal housing. And I was thinking about just like uh, taking a, you know, a hose clamp and uh, strapping it to the motor. Yeah, I think that was Carl's uh, exact Or comment. putting it, you know, mounting it elsewhere from one of the wires for it. So you kind of have a halting. So uh, it, was the, it was really the physical size. So I think what Carl's direction was is that he used a cable tie or something like that to uh, to strap it on. Carl was in error with 25 microvolts. I usually work in uh, in nanovolts and that stuff. So my 25 micro. Prepared was incorrect. But it was still a question of size and space. So you strapped it to the exterior yes yeah anything to give that you have to give it an offset in order to get it to spin and there's a little saying eli the ice man a voltage lag current which is eli and then ice is a current leads voltage but that's uh, immaterial you just need to spin it uh get an offset in order for it to pull to the next pole but yeah um not critical Okay, uh, Barry, uh, there is a website where you can actually uh, search for parts by uh, machine and model number. It's called ereplacementparts.com. Been and there, done that. They uh, did, okay. They do have probably uh, about 50 parts that adhere to the numbering diagram that JET, suppl that jet supplies. Unfortunately, on that 
jet numbering diagram, it doesn't show the, it just shows the motor. It doesn't show the capacitor and it never identifies the capacitor. That's true. And it, it's a topic of conversation on a number of wood turners or woodworkers websites that nobody has seemed to, I read a lot of questions posed, but no good answers. I would still call Jet and uh, you'd be amazed that sometimes they, uh, they're very uh, responsive. Okay. All right, that was my question. All right, thanks, Barry. Jim, are we uh, ready to go back to you, or are you paying too much attention to uh, Barry? No, I, I got I got the stuff ready, so <laughs> I will share okay. and make sure I share the right one. All right, uh, I guess we can take what we want. I I play with epoxy, and I was making some thirteen inch square cutting boards for my son-in-law's Oni pizza oven he has. Uh, they wanted uh, boards to put the pizza on when it comes out of the oven. And so this is pear from our homestead, very old pear tree that I, we cut down. And I took the ends of two of the slices and cleaned out as much of the junk in it as I could. Let me enlarge one of these. Uh, and filled it with black epoxy. And because I had not sealed, here's a clue, and maybe all you guys who work at epoxy remember to do this. I forgot to seal the, this wood before I poured the epoxy. And the reason that caught me this time was this black wood, uh, the black epoxies where there was a lot of quote unquote old rotted wood or whatever. I had cleaned out down and wire brushed it down, but I had not sealed it. So when I poured the epoxy, it soaked in like crazy and created all kinds of bubbles. I was on bubble guarding until it set up. And then overnight, it even soaked more. And then I had to fill in with more. And so I decided to go with pewter color just to, uh, so that's how I got that. What kind That's of epoxy cool. were you using, Jim? Was it a, a deep pour or something else? It's a deep pour. Only I only have deep pour in my shop. I I used uh, I think it was Upstart. I think this was Upstart. I got about three different brands that I use regularly. Uh, yeah, All right. Jim, I, how dry I, was your wood? You know, I just got myself a moisture meter, and I wish I could tell you. I hadn't written it down, but. Uh, good question, because this is very old. This was cut 15 years ago, maybe, and air dried in my shop. I mean, in my storage area next to the shop. I'm pretty sure it was down to 9 or 12%, but you're asking for a particular reason? Yeah, I, uh, I, have, I had two experiences now. I'll admit they were both using uh, Alumalite, oh. but it it reacts extremely badly to any moisture at all. And uh, it's when you put in a pressure pot and it came out as if it was, uh, it had foamed. It created foam bubbles right at the intersection of epoxy and wood. Well, I think you're referring to actually a, a polyurethane aluminum, which would be very moisture sensitive, but most of the deep pore epoxies are not very moisture sensitive and, and don't usually suffer the same problem. I I won't touch aluminite. It just doesn't work for me. Plus, I don't want to deal with the pressure prod. That's just more pain in the process. And I'm always, like I mentioned, always doing deep bore, even though this was only three quarters of an inch. So I I made a couple other ones, but I just learned a lesson here. I keep forgetting to to seal that, and I poured some recently, which I sealed again. Okay, here is the, I think I showed it very quickly live um, one day at the end of, and maybe it was last week at the end of it, a crotch from a walnut tree that was on the fence row of a farm of a friend's father-in-law. There we got that in-law again. Um, Brought it home and sliced it right down through the pith. And this is what I got. 
uh, when I turned it. Uh, just fabulous. I have a question for you guys who are very experienced. You see the cross grain ends, and if you look close, you'll see it's a little thinner there. That's because I had to sand like crazy to get the the tear out. What am I doing wrong? I sharpen my chisels. I, you know, it just walnut's particularly bad in my experience. Anything I'm doing wrong, don't tell me to sharpen my chisels. I'm doing that. <laughs> Did you try a negative rake scraper on the final cut? I have one and I have, uh, I've been having bad experiences with uh, scrapers in bowl turning because I've gotten a number of bad catches that rip chunks out. And I don't know why I, I hold it down against the, anyways, the negatives doesn't. I have one and I probably did, but it was that deep, uh, Barry, that um, I just, I, I could almost hardly get it sanded out even. It was just deep. So we're well, talking about the dreaded tear out in end grain of various woods and walnut, I agree with you, is pretty tough. But how fast are you turning would be one question. Uh, I rarely go above uh, 1,250. 1,500 seems like it's roaring to fly off the lathe to me. I know a lot of you guys start at 2,000 and go up to 3,500. That, that petrifies me. But, no, not for a bowl. A bowl. I mean, if this is a okay, if, uh, I normally I would get up to twelve hundred if I could, twelve fifty without it shaking or being out of balance too bad. I try to get. I like to get to fifteen hundred if things are balanced because it I think cuts better. Are you suggesting that I was cutting faster? It would be better on the tear out. Well, I was trying to decide what you were turning at. So if you're turning at a thousand to fifteen hundred, that's probably enough. If you're turning much slower than that, it's probably not. Um, then it's most likely if your tool is sharp, it's a question of what angle you have sharpened to and then how you're presenting the tool to the wood or kind of your other variables that are there. Um, but your you know, end grain on all woods is always a challenge. Um, but be interesting to hear others' perspectives. Uh, Mike, there were others. Uh, interesting what you but, might say. Well, the, the other fact that it wasn't mentioned is the feed rate of the tool. Uh, you know, speeding up your lathe is somewhat similar to slowing down the feed rate of your tool. And then the other thing for, for tear out is trying different uh, applications, uh, starting with the lowest and working your way up. And it could be uh, spritzing it with water. It could be uh, using boil linseed oil or mineral oil. You might escalate to paste wax all the way to, uh, you know, anything. What what I found on some of these things, besides the end grain, it's, it's the different densities of wood. So if you're hitting burl and then you're getting tear out shortly thereafter, it, you know, that that may be part of it. So I'd, I'd look at the feed rate of the tool. Uh, I agree with Mike, too. I, I like to put on, I do a lot of walnut like this. And uh, I usually use sanding sealer or mineral oil. Uh, you got to stiffen up the fibers a little bit. And the sanding sealer seems to be working lately for me. So that area right in there, you can see that's probably what's going to happen there. The other the, way, Tim, is that have you got a second bevel on your uh, bowl gouge? I do not. I use a 60 ground straight up uh, swept back. Right, because if you were to just take the heel off of your sharpening, yeah. that might yeah. take that part away that you're only using the tool. And depending on how you're presenting that tool to the, the wood, of course. And the other thing is that if I have a problem like that, I usually just coat it in CA glue, let that dry, and then turn that off. You know, I'm going to have to probably confess that I may have created my own problem. I'm thinking about it now. I hogged this out, and I'm using it term advisedly. I hogged this out with uh, Jimmy Clue's uh, mate tool. And I may have gotten too close to my finished width. This was a twice-dried bowl, by the way. I may have gotten too close when I hogged it out. 
and tore the grain down into where I wanted it to be. I I love his tool for hogging out, and I don't use a, a gouge for that. But when I went to finish it, maybe maybe his hogging out had already torn down into what I was keeping, and that may have been my own problem. So. I think there's a whole list of things one can do when it comes to uh, tear out in in end grain, and uh, I, you you've heard most of them. <laughs> there's no, there's no magic to it, I'm sure. But um, I I think the the suggestion to reduce the feed rate is probably the biggest one. Cut less, not higher. Uh, so so the idea there is that the chisel is presenting to his fibers more often. And not jumping ahead so fast. I I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, the I, other one is also using the smallest tool you can if you run into problems. Obviously, the larger the tool against the wood, the more friction you're going to have. Sometimes switching to a finer, for example, I use a three eighths inch bowl gouge sometimes as a finishing tool, just because there's less of a cutting edge uh, cutting on the wood. Mike, I think you're right on that. I don't know who I learned that from. I have a 5.8 that I do a lot of the big cutting with, and then I go to a half, and I notice that difference. And I bought myself a 3.8 recently, but the challenge with that, it doesn't have as much of a uh, rubbing bevel. You have to be a little more careful, in my experience, with how you use it. But yeah. Hey, by the way, one other question. I was watching, uh, I believe it was a cook guy, the occasional turns, I forget who. He was using a bottom feed or ground back on the tips, a bottom feed or a bottom bowl, bottom gouge as a roughing tool. And I thought, now that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's kind of like a spindle gouge almost, but, but a heavier and uh, anyways, just mentioning it. Uh, do I have anything else I want to show you? I think that was it. You guys have seen the rest of it. Any other questions for me? Uh, Jim, just a comment. Uh, I turn a good bit of black walnut, and I find that uh, it doesn't scrape very well. And I do my finish cut with uh, high-speed steel, just an M2. Nothing above that. It tends to cut much cleaner. It'll dull quicker, but for a final cut, I find it gives me the best results. A gal, a gal tray, not a scraper. Correct. Okay. Uh, I, I had, I had gotten a big, wide inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half wide, Benjamin Best. Sorry for saying that, but that was my price range, and I ground it nicely, and uh, it, it does a great scraping job. But every now and then, I get a catch it. I don't know why, but it tears a big chunk out of it. And, and I get scared of it, so I leave it up on the. I do have a negative rake that I don't have any trouble with. So, thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to go to Kai. Yeah, I just have a question for Jim. Is there any problem with the cutting boards you did for the the pizza? Um, if um the cutting board gets into contact with um anything hot like the the pizza or um. The next question would be, is there a problem if you have to clean it afterwards using detergent or something like this with the epoxy and the, the wood? Yeah, that's a very good question, Kai. And my son-in-law did not miss the opportunity to, to check quickly online. And he initially said to me, Jim, you can't put epoxy on one. This pizza is coming out of that Oni oven at 900 to 750 degrees. And he said that's at high temp is not good for epoxy safety wise but then he did more research he said jim i don't think that's right but you're right it's we know that it's going to get markings on it from cutting and stuff but it'll just be looking like it's used was that your question kai yeah but there's no problem with the food that it starts melting and sticking to the food or anything like that we haven't used it yet i made okay. a three um form recently so we're about to find out i think this weekend but I don't think it'll melt. I used Odie's oil on it. That's my finish, I go to finish for uh, epoxy stuff. So we'll find out. I told okay. my daughter not to to soak it in the dishwasher, put it in the dishwasher 
or soak it in the sink. You know, so. Yeah, you don't do that with wood anyway. That's right. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but it would be interesting to hear about your experience with that um, method and and sealing the the board or filling splits um, with epoxy. It's yeah. it's beautiful enough that if they can't use it for that, I don't care. Just put it up on the shelf and look at it. So, <laughs> yeah. I've also got something to. Sorry, I was going to say of all the resins we use, epoxy should be the highest melting, but I don't know. Um, where it might fail. But uh, when you say 900, you're talking Fahrenheit. So yep. it's not as, as crazy as it might seem right away. But um, well, I think by I, don't, the time I, that, I honestly don't know the answer, though. It's, uh, I think by the time that pizza gets off the paddle onto the board, it's probably down to 750, but that's still hot. <laughs> that's, that's still pretty hot. Yeah. You may want to try parchment paper on top of the board between the board and the pizza. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can't see the board. You can't appreciate the colors. <laughs> well, you Kai, just throw the paper you... away. <laughs> yeah, okay. Kai, what did you, you had something else, right? Yeah, I've got something small to fill in if uh, if we want to fill the last minutes, but if there's anyone else who wants to, it's okay. No, go for it, Kai. Okay, I'll try to share then. Um... Okay, can, what what's what effect is that now? Um, can you see that big all over the screen or just a little? No, it's big. It's big. It's big? Yep. Okay, it's not, it's not big on my screen. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, um, talking about small items that you can make uh, at a demonstration, for example, um, this is a cover for a glass to keep insects out in, in summer, like bees or um, whatever, um, little insects. And they are called Schoppendeckel in German. Deckel is um, a cover and Schoppen is what you drink. So um, it keeps your, um, your drinks from being attacked by these insects. And that's the idea. How will the insect... Um, react when it finds this this cover and um that was was one idea of a friend and she she made that graphic for me but um i burned it into the the wood and it took quite a long time so um i thought there must be other ways to do that um besides using um or burning it in with a laser so that is another way um i tried I um, printed it out uh, and she colored it for me as well. I printed it out, laminated it, um, and then cut out the, the laminated piece and put it into um, a recess in on the top of this um, glass cover or whatever you call that in English. Is there an English word for it or an American word for it? Yeah, English. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you call them? Glass Sorry? cover. Glass cover. Okay, so I'm not far off then. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Um, and actually, with this one, I um, I drilled this this hole using my largest force snub, it 58 millimeters that I had, and then cut that to size to to fit in there and glued it in. So let's go on. Um, that was another um, idea with the beetle um, conquering the the glass. Um, and that's the laminated counterpart. Um, okay, then a spider trying to get to the the beer with a um, mux. <laughs> and that actually is done using a laser. Um, <laughs> but laser burning takes quite a while, about ten minutes, twelve minutes it took to do that um, that picture. And it also takes about two thousand dollars to get the laser. No, no, it's um, an inexpensive one. I bought it for about one hundred thirty euros in Germany, so that should be really months. yeah. Because I've been laser. looking at them, and the the laser peckers are up in the thousand dollar range. Some of them, so they yeah. definitely no. are low cost options too. Huh? Yeah. That's. That's a very cheap one. I mean, it's not for industrial use. You have to let it cool down maybe after a while of using it. 
it's just for hobby use and it does only eight by eight centimeters that's um how many inches um a little less than four yeah a little less than four three and a half by three and a half or something like that yeah okay so and that's what the underside looks like it's um got kind of this is it a, a recess yes, here or or a step here so you can put it onto the glass and it doesn't kind of slide off the the rim of the glass so it's kind of fixed there in that position yeah and that's how i did the the cutting out of the the insert you could use instead of a um a photocopied image you could use a photo or whatever you want to to lay into um this piece or you could um, put it into maybe the lid of a box or something like this if you want to personalize it and that is um, it's a, a Japanese cutter I bought from Amazon I think um, it's got a little knife here and it's got a center finder and it's got this round thing here this round plate that fits exactly into this center finder so once you've found the center then you um, pull this out and press down here and it still did some sliding so i put some double-sided tape here to keep it better into position while cutting out the um, the laminated photocopies um, i had so yeah. cut a circle. sorry it's a nice way to cut a circle i haven't seen that apparatus before yeah, it's nice because you don't have the the point of your compass in the in the middle of the 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 circle, so it doesn't leave any marks on your um, cutout. And that's the the um, Japanese thing. I think I see one thousand five hundred p. That's um, what you need to uh, type into Amazon or so to find it, and it should be available in the states or Britain as well. So. And that's how I made the, the wooden part. Um, in this case, I used my vacuum chuck. There's um, a wooden rim here. And then I put the seal inside here. And um, the, the wooden part just fits into the kind of um, recess I drilled here. And then when I switch on the vacuum, the seal compresses and sucks the um, this wood against this and it registers really nicely. Um, but you don't need to do that. You could also have a kind of a press fit um, where you just press it on there. And to get the diameter right, I have a second disc here on a, on a one-way chuck that I put on there that gives me the, the right outer diameter so that I can turn the, the outside, I can turn the step in there round the edge over a little bit and then it's nearly finished for putting the insert in so yeah that's it okay. that is really just, nice kai what, what was the just name a little of filler machine, kai? sorry what was the name of that machine i see 15 uh, i i'll just just show it again just give me a second oh we are out of time but i'll, I'll try to be quick sorry um or just type it into the chat. Yeah, I don't know it by by heart. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I see fifteen hundred p is what I wrote down. Yeah, okay. Try that. I'll I'll Google that again or try it with Amazon. Tell you next time whether it worked. I got half. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> we <laughs> thank have you, uh, re we have reached the top of the hour. If there are any follow ups on that, we can uh, get to the next time. But uh, thanks all, and we're going to cut it off here. Have a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Bruce. Thanks, Jim. Well done, Bruce. Yeah, thanks, Jim and Bruce. Wood shop. Thank God for wood.